Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com, both free sites. Today is Thursday, March the 8th, 2018. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Let me just open by saying I'm shocked. That's the word. I'm shocked that Deontay Wilder still has his share of the heavyweight title. We'll talk about that, right? I thought he'd lose. But first, so much has happened in boxing. Let's touch on one story that, in my opinion, is being swept under the rug a little bit. Clenbuterol, the drug found in Saul Alvarez's system, is such a major drug violation, major, that it literally cost Lucas Brown his share of the heavyweight title. Now, folks, rules a sport that relies heavily on credibility, we can't play favorites, right? We, we really can't. If you're going to tell a heavyweight champion that this drug being found in his system strips him of his title, then anytime this drug is found in a fighter's system, it's big news. Now let me just say, clenbuterol, for those who don't know, is used for weight cutting. To the gamblers out there who remember that Canelo fought Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. at a catch right? Was that catch weight for Chavez Jr. or was that catch weight for Canelo? How comfortably is Saul Alvarez making 160 pounds? Right? I'll leave it up to the viewer whether they believe the tainted meat story. But I can tell you, I remember being in college and I remember talking to guys who coming up, right? That they knew they were going to fail. And we were coming up with cover stories on how a guy could explain a failed drug test, right? Maybe the millennials out there, maybe some of the people from the 1960s know what I'm talking about. You feel you might have some 420, some Mary Jane, some ganja, some marijuana, whatever word they use in your locale, in your system, right? Because it doesn't clear that fast. And you and your friends will start brainstorming about how you might be able to explain away the drug test, right? Let's say you're going for a job with the State Department. Yes, I had some friends who thought that was the career move, right? Okay, fair enough. Um, all I can say is people then started saying things like, hey, you know, say you went to a concert recently. Say that the air had a weird smell, but you were really there for the band. You didn't put two and two together until it was too late, right? Or say you were on a bus, and when you woke up, some guy next to you was puffing away. You weren't even aware of it. You were asleep when the guy sat down. Maybe that's what's in your system, right? People will even go so far as to say, look, whatever you do, cut your hair low. You don't want to hear follicle test. Right? You don't want the test going back that far. All these cover stories go out. Right? You say, hey, this was a one-time thing. I didn't really know what was happening. And then, of course, they point out that your hair indicates that uh, you were using for a long period of time. The point I'm trying to make is that people involved in cutting corners, right? Someone who is using something that might test positive 
on a drug test come up with stories beforehand, don't they? Right? Oh, why did I test positive for that? Uh, you know, I uh, like to eat sesame seed, <laughs> sesame seed buns. And maybe that triggered it. Right? Oh, that DUI that I got, you know what? As the guy was administering the test, I burped. Right? So when an athlete has a ready-made cover story, maybe you believe... It's not a cover story. Maybe it's the truth. You have to view that with suspicion. Right? So, we've already heard athletes say, you know what? I took a diet supplement. And this thing came back positive. Or, you know, I um, drank something right before I raced. And when I finished drinking it, there was a milky substance at the bottom. By the way, that's the Ben Johnson original story after he got busted at the 1988 Olympics. So now we have a story from Canelo, right, that he ain't tainted meat. How could you be enrolled in the VADA program? How could you be part of an event where you know you're going to be drug tested on a regular basis. How could you be wealthy, a multiple champion, right, with a team, with a staff that is looking over things like your weight and your nutrition and your food, and yet you're eating tainted meat, right? Think about it. I'm telling you, a lot of these fighters, when they're in training for a multi-million dollar fight, especially one that's a rematch of a draw, right? In other words, this is a career-defining fight that both fighters know is going to be tough because the other guy, according to the judges, earned a draw, right? At least according to the judges. How could you then have tainted me? Right? This is the kind of story that works for the rest of us. Right? I'm a college student or maybe I'm a middle-aged guy and I see the taco truck and I say, hey, let me go grab some food over here. Then maybe later I test positive and I'm thinking, man, maybe that hot dog I had at the ball game, maybe that taco I had at that taco truck uh, was tainted. Folks, fighters training for world championship fights aren't going to the taco truck down the block, right? They're not at the ball game having hot dogs a couple months before the fight. So you need to have a very raised eyebrow with regard to the Canelo story, right? Again, it's up to you whether you believe Canelo. I also understand the idea that we all protect people who are in our social circle, right? So you have some people coming out, El Terrible, Eric Morales coming out saying, hey, I back Canelo and stuff like that. I also understand too, when it comes to money, when you need a guy to be on the field or in the ring because they're big events coming down the pike. Right? There's always that group that's going to make excuses for that athlete. Right? You remember the whole Tom Brady overinflated air ball situation. Right? People were like, oh, come on. Why would Brady do that? Look at what Brady did in the second half of that game. Blah, blah, blah. Right? You know, no one wanted to actually look at the evidence right, received from the two guys who were involved in inflating the balls for Brady, right? There's always that group that supports the athlete, always. Well, if you're a gambler, you need to ask yourself more basic questions, right? Was Canelo on Clembuterol the first time? Right? Is he having problems making weight this time? Is Canelo's training so haphazard 
that he's having hot dogs at the local ballpark and he's eating food off the taco truck down the block. Right? I'm just telling you, <clears throat> I'm shocked. I've been following the betting line. And I'm shocked that Canelo isn't more of an underdog with this news coming out. Let's talk about Deontay Wilder. Now, let me say here online, um, I'm shocked. I personally thought the fight wasn't close. I thought Luis Ortiz was going to stop Wilder. People might recall, I had a conservative hedge. Right? My recommendation before the fight was Luis Ortiz to win the fight. Hedged with Wilder by KO. Right? That was the conservative hedge. But then I also talked about a more aggressive hedge. The under nine and a half rounds at a minus 160. Now let me say, I personally took the more aggressive hedge. Right? I gambled. It blew up in my face. I lost both sides of a hedge. So be it. This is gambling. There are going to be days when you get your ass kicked, and I got my ass kicked on this fight. If you were more conservative than me, you did all right, because you understood the only way Wilder was going to win this fight, and I know the judges' scorecards were all one round in his favor at the time of the stoppage, and I consider that to be Highly questionable, right? I thought the only way for Wilder to legitimately win this fight was by stoppage. And I didn't see that happening. I thought Luis Ortiz was going to have a share of the heavyweight title. Well, let me say this, right? Compare your notes to mine. Let's talk about the fight I saw. In the fight I saw, the entire thing turns on a clinch, which I did not think Wilder would be able to pull off. It turns on a clinch, a long one, at the end of the seventh round. Right, folks? Wilder is beaten up. Quite frankly, I thought he was beaten. I thought he was at least in as bad shape, as was Anthony Joshua when Vladimir Klitschko dropped him, right? But understand, with Joshua, Joshua then goes down. He has the benefit of part of the count. He gets up. There's a break. There's interaction with the referee, right? Vladimir Klitschko had to go to a neutral corner. So there's a little pause where a guy who's dazed had a few seconds to think about things. Here there's no pause. No pause. So Wilder's getting beaten up. The fight is over. And then he grabs Luis Ortiz. Now I thought Luis Ortiz was prepared for this moment. Right? I thought Ortiz understood when he gets Wilder hurt, especially since he's the shorter man, he needed to duck down, give Wilder nothing to grab. Right? If Wilder grabbed him, he needed to push Wilder off of him. He needed to do something. Luis Ortiz didn't do enough at the end of the seventh round. Right? The person who can relate to that is Vladimir Klitschko. Both Klitschko and Ortiz could easily have had shares of the heavyweight title as I make this video. Let me say this too. Wilder is so beaten. That's the word, beaten. That at the start of the eighth round in what can only be considered an absurd moment in boxing history. They delay the start of the round, if you could believe this. They delay the start of the eighth round so the doctor could look at Deontay Wilder. Folks, that's, that's absurd. 
right? I, what was that, a standing eight at the beginning of the round? Did they even give him a standing eight? Did they even know what the hell they were doing? So Wilder, let's just say, did not impress whoever it was that called for the break at the beginning of the following round. Now, isn't that, <laughs> let's just say, in a heavyweight title fight, that's stunning. That's stunning. Quite frankly, if the world weren't so political, and I give Wilder credit for doing much better, much better than I anticipated, but if the world weren't so political, why wouldn't the start of the eighth round negate the outcome of the fight? Shouldn't the sanctioning body step in at this point and say, look, something's dodgy at the beginning of the eighth round here. Wilder's badly hurt, and it's exactly at that time, after the brother has had, you know, the minute between rounds, that they decide to delay the start of the next round. Right? This, this to me is on par for the boxing historians out there. With Archie Moore dropping Rocky Marciano and then there being a pause in that fight. Right? So let's just say Wilder escaped. He escaped. Let's talk about some boxing logistics here. First, I know I'm going to get blowback on this. It's fine, right? <laughs> I believe in free speech. Go ahead and hit me with it. But on my scorecard, I didn't give Wilder any round until the fifth round. In other words, Wilder was so hesitant. He was so frozen by Luis Ortiz's movement to, let's turn here. Wilder's a righty. Ortiz Southpaw comes over, sets up shop right over Wilder's left shoulder. Right? It's, let's pretend you're Deontay Wilder looking out. Luis Ortiz early on sets up shop on the left hand side of Wilder's pocket. Right? It's to Wilder's left. And Wilder just didn't have the confidence to get him out of there by throwing a left hook. Right? Wilder was... Ortiz is a slick... Wilder was afraid to his jab. So Wilder spends the first four rounds hardly throwing anything. Now the problem is this is not the first Wilder fight we've seen this in. He hardly throws anything in the opening rounds against Gerald Washington. Right? The movement that much. So let me say, Wilder before this fight felt that he could beat prime Mike Tyson. I'd like to know was he talking about basketball? Was he talking about table tennis? Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe he beats Mike in those things. Not in boxing. Not in boxing. You you cannot tell me that a fighter this tentative, this slow volume, this hesitant early in about would have a shot against a fast starter like Mike Tyson. Right? I, I encourage anyone who thinks differently to look at the Trevor Burbeck film. Take a look at the film. Right? Mike's a fast starter. Deontay Wilder at this level. I don't want to hear about Wilder early in his career. Right? Wilder at this level. Against the Gerald Washingtons and the Luis Ortizes. Right? Guys who came out with some movement. Not for Mainster Vern in the rematch. 
but remains to Vern in the first fight. Wilder is a slow starter. Wilder is hesitant. We're in a hesitant champion era because Anthony Joshua, in my eyes, is hesitant against elite competition. By the way, these guys are now just starting to face elite competition. Right? Let me give credit to both. They've beaten elite competition. Joshua beats Vladimir Klitschko. Wilder beats Luis Ortiz. But, let me say, I thought that Wilder was down the first four rounds. Even at the end of the fight, on my scorecard, he's losing the fight. I'm not alone. Right? Paulie Malignaggi on Showtime thought Wilder was losing the fight. CBS Sports thought Wilder was losing the fight. Right? Let me say, too, I'm a big believer in what the great Bill Russell, a guy who I consider a role model, former center for the Boston Celtics, basketball royalty Hall of Famer, right? Russell has a theory that the great ones are always different. He believes that a fighter or an athlete who's unorthodox has an edge on an opponent who is accustomed to going up against orthodox opponents, right? Deontay Wilder is clearly unorthodox to the point where, you know, even as he moves around the ring, he's not up on his toes, right? Let me say, though, that I believe the opponent, in other words, he's so reliant, he's so reliant on that long right hand Right? He's so hesitant to lead with left hooks unless he has you dazed and confused already. He doesn't throw short punches unless, and he ended this fight on a short punch, he has you hurt. You're reeling around the ring. Then he leaps in and gets close enough to throw short punches. Right? Wilder, to me, really seems incredibly one-dimensional but I will say this right I can criticize Wilder I can say he's a slow starter the man does leave no doubt doesn't he he is the man with the golden gun the weapon he has is a plus level right that straight right hand is a championship level right hand I'll say this too a lot of fighting comes down to courage. Wilder looks semi-conscious to me at the end of the seventh round. He didn't panic. Right? He holds his He easily could have been trying to go back and trying to run away from Ortiz. Didn't do it. Right? He holds Ortiz. He keeps his head together. I give him credit. When they delay the start of the eighth round and they come over to him, Wilder does not complain. He's cool, calm, and collected. He does nothing to give the referee and the doctor the opportunity to end the fight at that moment. So Wilder's a guy who's unorthodox, who has the heart of a warrior, who ends fights by stoppage. Right? Only one of his fights have, have been decided by the judges. Right? You can't, you know, a guy like me wondering what fight these judges were watching can't claim that Wilder's only champion because of the judges. Because Wilder did come back. Because Wilder continued to throw heavy artillery late in this fight. But let's just say he's not a classic boxer for me. This isn't the only opponent who I would pick to beat Wilder. Quite frankly, if a rematch took place, and yeah, I'm bitter, absolutely. 
right? Second heavyweight title fight, the first being Joshua Klitschko, where my man looked like he was on the way to taking the title, right? But understand there are others at heavyweight who I feel would give Wilder a very hard time, including Joseph Parker, who I still believe is going to beat Anthony Joshua. So to the bomb squad, right? You're certainly supporting a warrior. Wilder's one of the most charismatic champions we've had in quite some time, right? You look at Wilder, you see the, the clothes. He likes to wear these lounge jackets. You see the hair. Don't overlook the hair. He's put a lot of effort into the hair. You see him in Brooklyn entering the ring and he has little Kim in front of him, right? He's making the effort to entertain us, right? And his fights, let's face it, they end decisively. Luis Ortiz has dropped twice in that 10th round, right? The second time he goes down hard. He's dropped three times in the bout. Right? But let's just say, I take my chances <laughs> betting on a prime Mike Tyson over him. When I see a champ who can't throw punches, right, who is risking his title by giving away the first four rounds, think about it. Only eight rounds are left in the fight. Wilder had to win, if you believe my scorecard, seven of the eight rounds left in the fight. To win the fight, if he gave away the first four rounds and if he didn't get the knockdown, he's going to face some guy someday who can use movement, avoid getting knocked down, who's going to box the socks off of him, right? We'll find out who that is. But let's just say this bout was his, and I congratulate him. Let me also say, too, that it's refreshing to see a heavyweight say the kind of things Wilder is saying, right? Wilder said, hey, it's not about the muscles. It's not about the weight. It's about the skills of the guy, right? His way of saying it's not the size of the man in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the man. Right? Wilder's a tall guy. He's slender. He's not trying to gain extra weight. Right? I know he said he was sick, so he lost some pounds, but he's not offering that as an excuse. Right? This guy goes out there, and whoever his opponent is, Wilder is going for the stoppage. Right? He's trying to leave no doubt. And he's the kind of guy who, when he gets caught, he doesn't run. Right? I congratulate Wilder on winning the fight. I'm still surprised by it. You know, I know Ortiz was a greater than 2-1 to underdog. I thought Ortiz should have been the favorite in this fight. Right? If you haven't seen the fight, I encourage you to see the seventh round, and the start of the eighth round. Understanding that Luis opens the fight, a clear gap in talent early in the fight. Ortiz is shooting a jab, right? Wilder's not shooting a jab. <laughs> Ortiz is shooting a jab. Ortiz is up on his toes. Ortiz is playing angles. He's coming in over Wilder's left shoulder. And Wilder is baffled. Right? Baffled. Anyway, that's how I see it. I lost this one. Congratulations to the Bomb Squad. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I look forward to your comments. Thanks for stopping by.